good morning, everyone. And uh, um, first of all, I'm not really here as a, well. I'm here as the rector of the university, but I should really be here as uh, this is my this is the place that I feel most at home because, uh, uh, and it's so great to see people who have been part of this uh, center since it was founded in 2000 in 2013 and to see people from abroad who have come back for a second and perhaps even third time right to participate in uh, activities uh, uh, in the center and believe it or not i've tried extremely hard to free two days so that i could be here and participate as a researcher right, in the uh, 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 but I, wa I wasn't able to do it sadly and uh, uh, i have to leave in about three minutes time Okay, and, and uh, um, which upsets me greatly, and uh, but that's the price one has to pay for being stupid enough to be elected director. Um, so, first of all, I want to say that uh, uh, just that I do some relevance to what the topic of what's going on here. That I noticed that uh, 300 years ago, more or less now, there was a synod in Oxford, right, in 12 in 12 uh, 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 22, which was basically a follow on from. Fourth Lateran Council, right, in uh, uh, 1215, and the Synod of Oxford uh, basically decided or prom prom promulgated all the, uh, many of the uh, uh, laws that had to do with the regulation of Jewish life within, uh, uh, within England. And 800 years later, I don't know whether you followed this, but there was a, uh, a church service in Oxford and a sort of symposium that had to do with taking back all the, or apologizing for all the, uh, uh, decisions made then by the church uh, uh, and it was a very interreligious uh, event and whatever the only one thing they didn't do was to revoke the prohibition uh, or sorry to prohibit converting Jews to Christianity in other words it's still uh, uh, legal in England for the church of uh, uh, the church of uh, uh, England to work to promote the conversion of uh, uh, and so I guess this conference, this workshop is very timely, right? Because it's still uh, uh, um, it's still on the agenda. I don't think it really is on the agenda, but but it, it's still officially uh, uh, part of the policy of the uh, of the uh, this uh, 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 gathering. So that's my little contribution to the. Uh, um, it's great to see people here whose books I'm now reading. I'm really really sorry that. Uh, I won't be here to hear uh, uh, their talks. I know that uh, that center is in great hands, where's Daniela and uh, uh, um, Michal and, uh, every, and uh, everyone else around the table. I wish you a great two and a half, two and a half days, one here, and one and a half in Jerusalem, together with the French, uh, the French Research Center in Jerusalem and uh, Ed de Marseille University, which is uh, uh, Great collaboration. We try. We've tried over the years to collaborate with uh, uh, other uh, universities, and and we've had some really really fun activities. I'm sure that this conference or workshop will live up to the reputation of the centre for great uh, uh, and enjoy very enjoyable uh, uh, um, conferences. And again, it's great that everyone, almost everyone, is here in person, and that we don't have to sit looking at uh, uh, our screens because, as we all know, while we very much enjoy the academic activity of the papers, much of the Really interesting things happen uh, in the informal conversations we have uh, uh, beyond the formal, beyond the formal sessions, and I'm sure that it will be uh, the same uh, here. So, I'm envious, in a, in a good way. Uh, have a great time, and uh, as well as intellectually stimulating. And I'm really sorry that I have to run because I have to go and greet in another uh, uh, far less interesting between you and me, but. <laughs> Uh, dear speakers, participants, and guests from far and near, uh, welcome to the National Conference to, on the Status of Converts in Jewish Communities and Jewish Thought, a conference organized by the French Research Center in Jerusalem with the support of Ex Marseille University and the Center for the Study of Conversion and the Interreligious Encounters, CSOC in short, uh, ben -Gurion, at Ben Gurion University of Benegev, to which we extend our thanks. It's really thrilling to see 
the intercontinental cooperation of universities, universities and research centers. It is even more exciting when realizing it revolves not around particle accelerators or space travel, but around deep cultural and spiritual questions underlying the foundations of our beliefs and our cultures. It shows the importance of studying humanities and social sciences, and I'm happy our faculty, as Michal mentioned, of humanities and social sciences holds what promises to be an exciting and rewarding day. The study of religions in our faculty is ubiquitous and can be found in history, Jewish thought, of course, but also in Middle East studies, sociology, anthropology, and even in the economics department, to name a few. Uh, not surprisingly, I found the economics of religious conversion term more than 17,000 times on Google. Uh, and I look forward to the possibility of insights appearing from today's presentations, interacting with, among others, the economic study of religious convergence. I would mention just two uh, famous economists who recently published papers on religious conversion. Uh, Robert Barrow, a famous macroeconomist from uh, Harvard, uh, and others presented in a 2010 study, the factors affecting religious convergence, both uh, theoretically and empirically in, over, in about 40 countries. And uh, Nathan Nam, an historian economist, also from Harvard University, uh, published in a 2010 uh, uh, study that looked at religious conversion in colonial Africa and the effect it has on current beliefs and religious choices of people in current times. So uh, there's a lot of interest in economics as well in these topics. Uh, I would also like to mention when I see the term Religious, uh, religious conversion, I recall that there are other conversions as well. There are a, a, a political conversions, lifestyle conversions, and I wonder if there is any uh, study to trying to connect all these kinds of conversions. Where are they more likely to occur? And what are their effects? And should they be encouraged? Should they not be encouraged? And, uh, and so on. Uh, special, I want to extend special thanks to Daniela Talmon Heller, the director of the CSOC, the organizers, Cartel Bertolo uh, from CNRS ex Marseille University, France, Michal Marcher Segal from Ben Gurion University, Yael Wilfand from Bar Ilan University. Uh, financial support was generously offered by, the, by Daniel Chaimovich, the university president, Chaim Hems, who just left, director and the faculty as well. Uh, so I will thank in advance the religious, the religious Services Minister, Matan Kahana, who recently presented a proposal to reform the state-sponsored process for converting the, to Judaism. I'm sure we did not, but maybe if he has some free time, he can read the paper by Asa Kasher and Daryl Rubinstein on the question, who is a J, a social approach, which deals with how do you define who is a person of a certain conviction or a certain uh, tendency? Uh, last but not least, uh, Ms. Ra Raya Evan David, the CSOC administrator. I wish you all an interesting and rewarding conference. I will stay for the first couple of hours and then I will leave also. Sorry. <laughs> I want to invite, uh, I'm calling you friends as well, and I hope that is a, is a very dear friend and a wonderful person and a great scholar, uh, head of the Center for Life Conversion, which is a great uh, Daniela from the Hill. Thank you, Michal. Thank you, Michal. I will begin with thanks to you who brought this conference uh, to our house, the CSOC, and to Katel. It was a pleasure to collaborate up till now, and I'm sure the conference will be an, even a greater pleasure to uh, participate in. Um, this is, and, and special thanks to Raya and to the funders of the conference on the side of the university, David, and the rector and the president and the vice president. Yes, so we <laughs> we did, yeah, we had a thorough job. <laughs> yeah. Appa apparently, apparently. 
Yes, I'd like to mention that this is the seventh international conference, the Center for the Study of Religious Conversion and Interfaith Relations is holding. So there were six previous um, conferences, um, but none of them dealt specifically with Giyu and Girin. So this is a wonderful uh, opportunity to complement uh, the uh, center's uh, engagement with the with matters of conversion. Um, I would, and I'm I'm especially happy we have this conference now it, because it gives us some uh, continuity with the original uh, purpose of the center. Uh, some of you may know that during the last four years, the center, even though preserving its historical name, is not focusing on religious conversion anymore. Uh, each year, we choose a different uh, central theme relevant to the study of religion from various perspectives. Um, so we had we engaged one year in the topic of um, religion and violence, uh, a, saints and pilgrimage. Uh, material religion, and this year, rethinking center and periphery in the Abrahamic traditions. The topic for next year is uh, religion and the natural environment. But still, each year, and it happened also the previous year, we try to have at least one event that ties and brings us back to the original purpose of the a, of the center, and which is such an, an, an important theme in the study of religion, as David has mentioned, from various perspectives, the historical, the theological, the uh, social, the anthropological, and the economic. And strangely, I've also prepared you know, my very, very short contribution um, with in a, a regarding this aspect, the a possible economic um, a consequences of encouraging or disencouraging uh, con religious conversion. I will not say anything about conversion to Judaism, but I'll say very short words about conversion to Islam. And uh, it, the um, pro problematics of conversion to Islam as regarded at the beginning of the eighth century. So I will, I, I brought a very short text attributed to the seventh Umayyad Caliph, uh, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, or Omar II, who is supposed to be the only righteous Caliph in his dynasty, as regarded from the perspective of, uh, the, of the Abbasid period, uh, uh, after the fall of the Umayyads, of course. So uh, the, the primary reason uh, for this uh, positive appraisal of the, this specific, specific Caliph is his attempt to reform uh, conversion to Islam uh, by lifting a economical, um, or rather by equating the economical status or more specifically taxation of converts to that of Arab Muslims. So until his days, and this is very clear, uh, converts to Islam continued to pay the poll tax incumbents on Jews, Christians, Zoroastrian, Magians, um, and, and others. And uh, uh, this was, of course, an impediment or a disencouragement for uh, taking upon the Islamic uh, identity. Um, Omar ibn al-Aziz, in a contrast to the interest of the empire and to the views of the uh, tax governors and uh, tax collectors issues a, a decree um, forbidding the continuous taxation of converts to Islam in the manner uh, done before. And he writes the following. Now, God sent Muhammad, God bless him and give him peace with his guidance and the religion of truth to make it victorious over all religions, even though those who worship other together with God, reject it. So, so he begins with the Quranic phrase. Whoever accepts Islam among those who today pay the jizya, the poll tax, whether Christian, Jew, or Magian, and associates with the company of Muslims in their land, abandoning his previous abode, so we see there is also a demographic aspect of assuming Islam, is to have what the Muslims have and to be subject to what they are subject to. And it is the Muslim's duty to associate with him and support him. So this is a, 
call to the governors, to the tax collectors, but also to the Muslim community at large to accept the converts and make them a one of the community. Um, most likely this reform never took place due, or didn't take place during the very short reign of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz years, but the universalistic vision of the mission of the a Muslim caliph a sank in uh, gradually. And um, after a while, we indeed find that the, a, an, an attempt, which naturally took time to make this, the economic and the social status of converts to Islam equal to that of Arab Muslims. I'm sure the problem of the uh, discrimination against converts and the attempt to in equalize their status and to engage them in the community will be one of the topics uh, addressed during this conference in the Jewish context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela. And, uh, I am thrilled to uh, invite my co-organizer and uh, uh, heart behind this conference. And she brought me to the conference, as you say, to uh, uh, start our talk. Thank you, Michal. So first of all, uh, on behalf of the French Research Center in Jerusalem of Aix-Marseille University, and in my own name, I want to thank Ben Gurion University and the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters for welcoming this initiative and supporting uh, this conference project. I express my deep gratitude to Professor Daniela Talmon, the current head of the CSOC, and also to Professor Ephraim Schoen Steiner, its former head, as well as to Raya Ivan David, its administrative manager, his efficient work has proved invaluable for the organization of this conference. Uh, as you know, we were supposed to gather uh, a year ago, but had to postpone the event because of the COVID pandemic. It is a great pleasure to go back to an in-person type of conference and to finally be able to meet each one of you today. I am extremely glad that we have succeeded to gather such an amazing group of scholars from both Israel and abroad and I want to thank you all for your commitment and your presence today. This conference, however, is not exclusively an academic event. From the very moment that we started organizing it, we decided to bring into the conversation not only scholars, but also people who would share with us their reflection on Giyur in Israel today, as lawyers, teachers, rabbis, artists, or people involved in conversion issues in other respects. Hence, we invited the film director, Nurit Yaakov Zinon, to share and discuss with us her documentary movie on the ritual of immersion of the mikveh for female converts, a movie that we will see at the noon break. We also invited Elad Kaplan, a lawyer who has filled several class action lawsuits in the Supreme Court and is one of the founders of the Giyur Ka'alacha Conversion Court Network, to share his experience with us. And we shall also hear a voice stemming from Reform Judaism in the person of Nicole Maor, Director of the Legal Ed for New Immigrants Program at the Israel Religious Action Center. As most, maybe all of you now know, the current Israeli government has initiated a process that aims to reform the rules of Giyur in Israel. When we started planning this conference two years ago, we could not anticipate that it would take place in such a timely context. Admittedly, the issue of the conversion of non-Jewish immigrants to Israel has been on the agenda of political and religious authorities for quite some time, especially since the Aliyah of the Jews from the former Soviet Union. Yet it is a wonderful coincidence that the topic has returned to the forefront of political, religious, and social debates in Israel in the last few months, in connection with the reform project of the Minister of Religious Services, Matan Kahana. Tomorrow morning at the French Research Center, we will have the opportunity to meet the minister and ask him questions about various aspects of uh, the current process. The purpose of this conference, however, is in no way limited to reflecting on contemporary situations and evolutions. 
as you may have noticed, its three co-organizers, Michal Barasher Sigal, Yael Vilfand, and myself, all work on ancient Jewish sources and study Giyur and Gerim, first and foremost in the context of antiquity. Giyur, or conversion, is one of these fascinating topics that are present in Jewish history from the period of the Bible up to our time. Even, even though the meaning of the word gerim in the Tanakh differs from what it means today. The importance of the topic of gerim lies inter alia in their liminal status. As outsiders who become insiders, they cross a boundary and raise the question of the definition of this boundary, which is tantamount to the definition of the Jewish people itself. In an important study titled Transforming Identity, the Ritual Transformation from Gentile to Jew, Structure and Meaning, Avi Sagi and Tzvi Zohar thus write that deciphering the Giyo process can provide a key to comprehending the meaning of Jewish identity. As a matter of fact, the status of Gerim within the Jewish collective, which is the particular focus of this conference, is intrinsically bound to the ways that one defines this collective. Sagi and Zohar, whose study concentrates on rabbinic thought, identify two paradigms which they label the Dmai model and the Yevamot model, respectively. The Dmai model insists on the convert's commitment to live a life based on the commandments of the Torah. His or her integration into the people of Israel is basically a consequence of this commitment. Conversely, the Yevamot model sees Giyur as a new birth, a recreation of the convert as a Jew for immersion preceded by circumcision for men, with the implication that just like native Jews, the converts have the obligation to live in accordance with the Torah. According to this model, the Yevamot model, the girl's commitment to the Sinaitic covenant is a consequence of his or her transformation from a Gentile into a Jew, rather than a preliminary condition or a starting point. These two views of Giyor somehow relate to the two fundamental definitions of Israel that one already finds in the Bible. Israel as a political religious community linked by a shared commitment to God's law at Sinai, and Israel as a kinship group in which one is supposed to be born. The Dmai model that Sagi and Zohar identify in rabbinic literature matches the definition of Israel as a political religious community, while the Yevamot model corresponds to the definition of Israel as first and foremost a kinship group. The importance granted to these two dimensions, commitment to the law and kinship or ethnicity, has greatly varied throughout history, depending on the period and the particular type of Judaism that comes under scrutiny. Yet a complete renunciation of one of these two dimensions, abandoning either the ethnic aspect or commitments to the mitzvot altogether remains rare. What is absent from both the Dmai and the Yevamot paradigms is the connection to the land. Biblical Gerim are defined at least originally by the fact that they settle among the children of Israel in the land of Israel. They are characterized by a non-Israelite genealogy, which entails a lack of property rights as far as land ownership is concerned. In the past exilic period, the book of Ezekiel shows an evolution in this regard toward a greater integration. As Ezekiel 47, 22 states, you shall allot the land as an inheritance for yourselves and for the Gerim who reside among you and have begotten children among you. They shall be to you as the native, the Ezrach, among the children of Israel. With you, there shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. The territorial dimension of the Ger's integration into Israel recedes in the background in rabbinic, medieval, and early modern Jewish texts for obvious reasons. In the context of the modern state of Israel, however, the geographical dimension returns since it is the lasting presence of relatively well-integrated non-Jews in the country that triggers the need for a swifter conversion process. 
In connection with non-Jewish spouses or children of Jews who made Aliyah together with their relatives, some scholars speak of a sociological conversion because these non-Jews have become Israeli citizens and have embraced the Jewish-Israeli nationality. That's Jacobson's definition. Yet for religious authorities and probably for most Israelis, this type of civic and cultural integration into the Jewish-Israeli collective is not sufficient, which means that the ethnic dimension of Jewishness with a reference to shared ancestors, be they mythical or real, remains a major factor of identification. In antiquity, the main issue for the status of Gerim was probably their non-Israelite lineage. Today, with the possibility of conversion firmly established by rabbinic tradition, the main issues seem to be located at the level of religious practice, like what degree of religious practice is to be expected from a convert in a Jewish world that is divided into different branches, and the articulation of citizenship and ethnicity, or nationality, as some others put it, in the framework of the state of Israel. The factors that have impacted the status of converts in the past and that imp impacted today have thus been varied and have evolved with the passing of time. By looking at several case studies throughout Jewish history, we hope to get a glimpse of this diversity, but also to be able to identify possible continuities or recurring motifs and to better assess the significance of converts for definitions of Israel in the past as in the present. I wish to thank all the participants and the organizers again. I very much look forward to the lectures and to our discussions, and I wish us all an exciting and fruitful conference. <laughs>